Sorry. Ready as I'll ever be. Wired up. Okay, you're. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm, uh, you all know who I am. I'm Dr. Gordon Gao, um, academic director of the MACT program in the Faculty of Extension. University of Alberta respectfully acknowledges that we're located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Metis, Nakoda, Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. Thank you for joining us at the 2019 Spring Institute Research Symposium here at the Enterprise Square in beautiful downtown Edmonton. It's increasingly more beautiful as the trees come into bloom. Um, I would also like to welcome those who are joining us on the internet and around the world via live stream. Uh, this symposium marks the conclusion of our annual three-week Spring Institute. This is an intense time for our graduate students and our faculty and support staff, but it really forms an essential component of the MACT program. About half of your coursework is actually done during the six weeks over the two Spring Institutes that you're here. Our returning cohort has put on a remarkable show of poster presentations under the leadership of Dr. Megan Lefebvre. Uh, and the posters are an excellent reflection of the diverse range of research interests among a really incredible group of students. Uh, so I'd like you and everybody else to give you a round of applause for all that hard work and those amazing contributions. It's just the beginning of the journey. <laughs> so, uh, but it'll be a rewarding journey and it's a really important first step, getting your thoughts down and being able to talk about them and getting the feedback and the tips and the pointers. And, and I think the spirit of the event is really important. Uh, it really is, I feel, always feel energized afterwards. And, and that's a lot, because at the end of three weeks, um, it's important to come off with that feeling. Our new cohort has survived their first Spring Institute, the boot camp. Yeah. Uh, the three weeks go by pretty fast, hey? After, yeah. Uh, and you're ready to dive into the online experience now. Uh, and we know that the connections you've made during the past three weeks are gonna carry forward and grow stronger. Uh, as you continue in the program and make your way towards Spring Institute 2020 when you'll be back here and you'll be doing your posters. I would uh, like to very much thank uh, Eileen and Susan. Where are you? Eileen, you're, where are you? There's Eileen back there. And Susan is out, Susan's out there somewhere um, for the, your tireless efforts during this busy time. Uh, we really couldn't do it without you and Susan. There's a lot uh, in the, that you do to, to program the Spring Institute and make this happen. So thank you for that. And I would also like to thank Dr. Lana Whiskey Jack for leading us this morning on the River Valley Walk and in the smudging ceremony, uh, which is something new we've introduced in the program. And um, hopefully all of the graduate students that joined in that um, not only enjoyed it, but felt that it was uh, a good experience from a cultural perspective. Each year, the uh, MACT program sponsors a distinguished speaker to talk on an issue of relevance to the field of communications and technology. This year, I was delighted to have Mr. Graham Everton accept our invitation to come to Edmonton to share his story about radio spectrum, indigenous rights, and what may very well be the future of the internet in many ways. Uh, I learned of uh, Graham's story back um, last year. I was reviewing a book manuscript for, I think it was McGill Queens. And, uh, and in that book manuscript, there's a chapter 
about the story of radio spectrum in New Zealand and Maori and Graham's involvement in that and I knew immediately that this was a story that uh, was important one to share with us uh, and I believe it's an important story because it, it causes us to reflect on the vital resource we all depend on uh, even though we don't realize it uh, it's the resource that runs our Wi-Fi devices and our cellular devices and and pretty much everything, almost everything we connect to the internet these days, that's the radio spectrum. Uh, and radio spectrum might seem like an arcane technical topic. Uh, and Michael McNally's nodding. <laughs> but, and it is <laughs> in some ways, but it is in fact, uh, the history of radio spectrum and radio spectrum allocation is a history of the story of the social shaping of technology. And it has political and economic, cultural and historical dimensions um, that uh, play out, have played out in the past and continue to play out. We're going to learn a little bit about that today. So, Mr. Everton was trained as a radio communication technician and joined the New Zealand Post Office uh, radio communication branch in the early 1980s. One of only two Maori radio technicians in the post office at the time, he became concerned at the lack of Maori participation in a vital growing economic sector. With the introduction of the mobile phone in the late 1980s, Graham was among the first technicians to install, operate and maintain mobile phone systems in New Zealand. And it was during this time that he began advocating for Maori ownership of the radio spectrum. He believed that if Maori owned and managed radio spectrum, this could be leveraged into building long-term Maori capacity in the information and communication technology industry. His work eventually led to the Maori spectrum claim to the Waitangi Tribun Tribunal in 1999, which he's going to talk about this afternoon, in addition to some other things. Graham has spent time in Canada, in Toronto, um, and that's okay, Toronto's all right. We'll, We'll forgive you for that. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that. And has worked with First Nations communities in Ontario and Quebec. During this time, he established Area Foods, an initiative dedicated to linking the consumer with Indigenous food producers. He contributed to the first digital strategy for Food Share, a Toronto-based community food agency. He co-founded Pow Wow Pitch, the first business competition pitch competition for First Nations held at traditional Pow Wow. He has become an advocate for the development of an international indigenous trade and investment network and sees potential in indigenous people working together globally to develop businesses that are underpinned by shared values relating to the guardianship of the environment, respect for people, and the retention of language and culture. In 2016, Everton returned from Canada to New Zealand and has established a company developing Internet of Things and 5G applications for rural community development. So before we begin, I would also like to acknowledge and thank the Cool Institute for Advanced Study, who's helped support uh, Mr. Everton's visit with funding from the Dialogue Grant Program. And with that, I would like to ask you to please join me in welcoming Mr. Graham Everton. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko tainui te waka, ko taru te maunga, ko huku te awa, ko nga tukuwaru te marae, ko nga te raukaua te iwi, ko nga te pariraukaua te hapū, ko rangahau taku whaia, Graham taku papa, ko Graham Everton Ahau. Taringa whakaroa, te omau. Oha kamate, kamate kora. Oha kamate, kamate kora. Oha tanei te tangata, huru, huru ngā ngā ititi, mai whakawhiti tērā. Ha hupane, ha hupane, ha hupane, kaupane, whiti tērā. Hello. 
Um, I introduced myself, and one of the things uh, that we do as a tradition is our people. We start with where we came from, how we got to a place, and the significant uh, uh, cultural icons around us, which is usually our mountains, our rivers, our land, our people, and our meeting house. So I spoke to a Tainui, a waka, the waka or canoe that brought us from the Pacific into New Zealand. I talk about our maunga, Tararua. I talk about our river, Hokio. I talk about my marae, our meeting house, Ngātukawaru. I talk about my tribal group, Rokoa. And I talk about my sub-tribe, Parirokoa. And I talk about my mum and my dad. And then finally, I talk about myself. There's another line below me, my daughter and my grandchildren and they will get the chance to include me in their whakapapa when they talk, uh, talk about, uh, about our past and our future. <clears throat> so I just, a, a few things. Uh, I understand that New Zealanders speak fast. So if I do speak too fast, wave your hands, I'll slow down. Um, uh, sometimes we're hard to understand. Don't worry, uh, New Zealanders find me hard to understand. So you're, you're in the sort of same boat, but I will try to speak more clearly and a bit more slowly. Um, <clears throat> I really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak here. As, uh, as Gordon said, I did spend time, seven years in Toronto, um, but as, as I say, I learned a lot uh, about Canada from that experience, and I enjoyed the, the, um, the opportunity to be here and, and uh, interact with the communities, uh, particularly the First Nations communities that I was, was involved in. Um, I went home, it was sort of a, it was a, I had a partner here, but I had to go home because I, um, one thing I really missed was my grandchildren. So I have three grandchildren, and every time I returned back, they were always asking me to, when I was going to come home. So I got to a point in my grandson's life where he was going through a bit of trouble, and uh, his father died, and so I made the decision to return home. And it was you know, a couple of years ago now, and um, it's been a, a great journey with my grandson. He lives with me where I, where, um, I live today, and uh, we're having this continuous journey He's 14. Love him to bits, but he's a nightmare. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll talk a bit more about him. Uh, I'll, I'll just sort of, um, sort of wander through this journey that I've had. It's, uh, in terms of the talk today, it sort of relates to a journey that I started 25 years ago, almost at a quarter of a century. Isn't that sort of sound really long time ago? Uh, in the internet sort of world, that's centuries, right? It's just, you can imagine what 25 years ago was, we considered the top of the line now was, you know, just not anywhere near it. Um, but firstly, I just want to, has anybody been to New Zealand? Great. <laughs> it's good. It's good. Not a bad thing. So just to make sure you clear out New Zealand, this is New Zealand. There's this another island next door called Australia. So do not confuse us with Australia, right? <laughs> You know, they're like that annoying younger brother, they're, they're there. Uh, we're, we're friends, but, you know, only just. Um, so this is, this is New Zealand. It's made up of uh, actually three islands. So we know the two, North Island, very innovative names, South Island, and the last one down here is Stewart Island. Um, I live roughly around, around here, sort of the... Um, this is the, the main island. This is where the major population of, of New Zealanders live. Um, I live around here, uh, but I was brought up just down off the, off the coast here. So it's not... One thing I quickly learned when I came to, to Canada, when people talked about it's just down the road, yeah. that sort of meant like two hours, right? In New Zealand, down the road, it's like maximum is 20 minutes. So I had to adjust very quickly to this idea when people said, we're just going down the road. It was a, quite a mean journey. Um, the other, good thing, the other good thing about that, we're never too far from a beach. Even if we go inland, you know, there's only a couple of hours to get to the beach. I think I took my first trip to the beach in Canada was to uh, Nova Scotia. And, you know, a good 18 hours travelling in a, in a thing. Well, wow, yeah, that's pretty, pretty, pretty cool. Um, and even though I lived in Toronto, and everybody tried to convince me that the beaches in Toronto were real beaches, I said, nah, it doesn't have that sea smell. It doesn't have, it's not a real beach. So... It was a really, um, again, another sort of thing to learn about, um, about that. So it sort of, yep, this sort of puts me in the place. Um, what, I was, what I sort of uh, 
have the opportunity to talk to you today is, is my journey with regards to radio spectrum. And yes, radio, what's, you know, we know about radio spectrum, but it's, it's not one of those conversations you sit at the dinner table and start talking, oh, well, the radio spectrum is really cool and that type of stuff. <laughs> it's quite a, a geeky type of um, concept, but it is really critical, you know, to the infrastructure, even back before fiber and all these more modern technologies, in New Zealand, the only way you could make an international call before satellites, and in the 50s, was used in radio, and they called HF radio. So basically, it would just bounce around the world, and you'd make these overseas calls. I actually worked, uh, it was coming to the end of its cycle in terms of that technology being used for communications. At the end, it was used for ship-to-shore type stuff. I worked in, in the, the, the last of that facility, and you look in your, your little cell phone pockets and all that, that type of stuff, and that, you know, same principles, it's still transmitting and receiving. But these transmitters were 100,000 kilowatt transmitters. They were the size of this room, basically. And uh, they were so powerful that uh, the wires would go out through this hole in the, in the roof, and they would have uh, these fluorescent lights sitting above them, and they were always glowing because the energy it was producing would affect the, the lighting and stuff like that. But that was the basis of my, my start in the industry. And as I moved through that industry, I was one of the very few Māori that actually was in that industry. And um, back then, I, I guess I wasn't so aware. I mean, I knew my culture. I, I was brought up in it. Um, we always were at the marae, our meeting place with our people. So I had a, a good cultural background. But then I moved in this community, away from where my community was. It was a, now we have a term, so this other thing is, we have a term for non-Māori, it's called Pākehā. It's not a derogatory term, it's just, we're Māori, you're Pākehā. And it tends to, uh, you know, it's just a word for all others, basically. So when I use the word Pākehā, that's just my indication that the other, the other part of this, our, our treaty relationship, uh, Pākehā, uh, were predominant where I, where I moved to. And I remember, as I, um, as I progressed through that organisation, I remember walking into our staff room and on the table there was a discussion, because these were all t radio technicians, there was a discussion about how Māori were claiming the radio spectrum for broadcasting, radio broadcasting and TV broadcasting. And I'm scratching my head, I think, oh, that's, that's interesting, I'm, I'm, you know, it's a, a concept. But the rest of the guys were quite, um, again, they were just, just, gobsmacked the idea that Māori could be claiming this radio spectrum. They're all technicians, they knew about it, but there just was no reference point that they could understand how Māori could be claiming the radio spectrum. So I thought, thought about that, and then so I started my journey to um, reach out to the people who uh, were involved in that original claim, and they eventually did get it through, and on the basis that Māori needed radio spectrum, spectrum so they could broadcast their language and their culture. So that was the basis of that original win about accessing radio spectrum. The Crown wanted to sell radio spectrum. Māori said, before you can sell that radio spectrum, you have to ensure that we have enough to broadcast our language and our culture. And that sort of formed the basis that we did have rights to radio spectrum, but in a very narrow context. Um, which brings me to this thing here. So this is our treaty, it's a bit rough looking, but we signed the treaty in 1840 with the Crown. So when I talk about the Crown, at the time that was the representative and the government, was, uh, the government represented the Crown. So when Māori talk about relationship with the Crown, they mean relationship with the community, the, the Pākehā community, but we always acknowledge that relationship starts with the Crown. So in 1840 we signed this treaty, um, you know, has only three articles, so it's not really detailed, but it has only three articles, which defines the relationship, not the specifics. So the first part of that, and the, we've got to keep out the wording here, so the first one is kawanatanga, governance. So when we talked about governance, uh, the Crown thinks governance is sovereignty, the Māori thinks, no, you're just a partner in this, you don't take sovereignty. But the Pākehā version of the treaty, the English version of the treaty versus the Māori ver version were very different. Māori didn't cede sovereignty, but the Crown assumed sovereignty in the first article. The second article talks about Māori, and we perceive that as sovereignty. So the rights over our ownership of our land, our control of, or management of our land, our water, 
and taonga, which is a very broad term for treasure. So anything we define as, as our treasure, our knowledge, our language, our stories and stuff, that was considered under our control. The third article was just basically said, uh, you know, you have all the general rights and obligations of a crown subject. So the sort of broad term, just saying you're, you're all equal. Um, so the treaty became the basis of our relationship and like many treaties, it became relatively dismissed as the um, Pākehā communities went out and started to grow and they became the dominant force within New Zealand. And very much during that early uh, 1800 period through the early 1900s, it basically became a null and void document, actually. Um, it wasn't until the 70s, uh, oh, 60s and 70s, where there was a lot of activism internationally that uh, the treaty came back into the frameworks. And in those early days, there was a whole... Um, uh, movement behind it and there was often the chant, chant the treaty is a fraud which really you know kept so if the treaty is void and was not null and void then we'll go back to sort of we'll be um, independent and we'll create that type of stuff so there's a whole whole period there when eventually more arguments started to occur around what the treaty meant to the to, to New Zealand and though it's not a constitutional document the courts tended to start to rule not so necessarily on the articles themselves because they weren't you know, specific, but what they call the principles. So all the work, all this type of gains we started to make was on the intent and the principles of the relationship that the Crown and Māori had intended. Um, that is still ongoing, so you know, there's no one fixed stuff, uh, one fixed interpretation of it, and it keeps being applied and keeps being applied in different circumstances. Which has made the treaty quite a, a robust and living document. You know, you're not seeding anything. You continue to grow. Um, you know, one period in time, you, it might have been an acceptable issue you're dealing with, but t with time and people's understanding, it gets to a point where we can start talking about issues that are particularly hard, maybe. Um, so during that same period in 1975, the government set up a tribunal. Uh, a, a permanent tribunal that would look at issues related to the treaty, the relationship with the, between the Crown, and um, you know, deal and make recommend findings and then recommendations. So all the early land claims, all the issues around, uh, still today, all the land claims issues came through this tribunal. Um, so the early ones were on fishing, uh, language and culture, on uh, land disputes, and, and that type of framework. Um, by the time I came into discussions about the radio spectrum, it was in the sort of uh, 90s, um, a lot of those, tra those traditional resources we understood were sort of being covered by the, the tribunal. And then suddenly all these new type of modern claims started to appear. So language was considered a, a modern claim. And where, the ed where we could introduce things like language, um, there are the, a claim for flora and fauna, um, IP-based type uh, initiatives, in my case, radio spectrum, it, hin it, it hinged on this idea of Tonga, what was our treasures? So Māori would always say that actually everything's our treasure. It was never not considered as part of, when we signed this treaty, we, we never imagined that the things that we knew, we understood our stories, our access to land, our access to resources. We never envisioned that somebody else would own those or take those off us. And it was the opposite interpretation, obviously, from the Crown. They start with the principle that we are entitled to it all and they will dish out that type of stuff. So the, a, lot of this, a lot of these discussions, a lot of these tribunal claims tend to sort of revolve around, you know, that interpretation and what is what. Um, so by the time I got uh, this claim, in the 19, uh, late 1990, uh, 1998, 1998, I'd been in the process for a while. I remember walking around early on to people, my, uh, people from Māori institutions, lawyers, um, depart um, government departments saying, well, you know, there's this, there's this treaty right here. We, we should be allocating spectrum, you know. Uh, the Crown had just set up a new law which basically said it owned Spectrum. Before that it was a sort of a public good. Suddenly they set up a law in 1982 and they just assume that Spectrum is theirs. So by the time we got through the uh, language claim, there was some recognition, but not recognition totally. And then by the time we got to uh, 1998 and took the claim, and in fact I didn't take the claim, my mother took the claim. By the time we got into the tribunal, um, <coughs> uh, 
we were sort of one of those first, after the flora and fauna claim, that intellectualised what property started to look like. So in this case, we said radio spectrum is a taonga. It's something that we find precious and we should be able to utilise that to build the resources and stuff first. And Crown, no, you don't have this exclusive ownership. And it was quite a funny reaction because we'd ha we had to spend like six months, well actually probably a year really, writing letters, you know, having this trail to show that we had tried to discuss this with the Crown. And the officials were so arrogant, it was perfect. Like they were just saying, no, there's no way, you know, you, you guys are, you know, it's just not on. And so by the time we got to the tribunal, they looked so unreasonable, and we looked so reasonable, that <laughs> the tribunal ruled in our favour. But it was one of the first tribunals that did a split. So it, it had a judge, uh, usually it's a panel, so there's a judge and a couple of experts um, who, who rule on these type of things. And it was one of the first claims where they split, the judge said, uh, we're not so, not so sure about this. There is a right, but it's hard to envision how Māori could have conceded it. And then the two panellists, who were really well respected, ended up agreeing with us. Um, they made findings in our favour, and they made recommendations, which basically said to the Crown, let's negotiate. You know, you, you have a role to play in this. Māori have a, plot, or have a role to play in this. They want spectrum. They want some of that funding that comes, or that money that you get when you sell the spectrum, and they want to go out and develop. Unfortunately, uh, the Crown just couldn't deal with that. They decided not only to reject the recommendations, but it was, again, it was one of the first where they actually uh, rejected the findings. They just could not envision the idea that this technology base was what we were claiming. Um, and so that was 1999, and since 1999, we've continued to go back to the Crown every few years. And then, Chris, when we talk about Crown government, so the government of the day changes, and then the next government comes in, and you've got to rediscuss this type of stuff. But one of the things that, I guess, is the history of Indigenous people, um, is they have this collective knowledge. So it is not unusual for Indigenous people to hold in their consciousness an issue, like a land claim, for 150 years. So we've got claims that go back, acknowledgements that go back. I think there was an acknowledgement over the last couple of days by Trudeau about Poundmaker, you know, a chief. Again, that was a collective knowledge of that community, a bear in that community that gets travelled through. So time isn't our enemy, because we'll just keep going back and going back and reminding the government, and with each government there's a change in each inch you get. So 20 years on, we're back at the table, we're now discussing a generation of technology. So when I sat back, when we talked about, in 1999, we talked about the potential of the internet. We talked about the potential of getting uh, you know, Google on, and Google was really early then, but you know, getting it on your phones. And you know, people were still staring, thinking, what the hell is this guy talking about? Um, I remember, because my mother took the claim, there was a sort of technicality why she took the claim. And I remember discussing these things with her, and she, wouldn't have a clue, it just, uh, just went over her head. But the reason that she supported the claim and took the claim is that she as a child um, was uh, sent to school, a, a Catholic school, could only speak Māori. By the time she left that primary school, she had lost it, her language and a lot of her culture, on the basis that they um, said to be a good Kiwi, a good New Zealander, you had to lose your culture and become assimilated into the Pākehā culture. So for her, that was a really deep hurt that she carried through. And then when she got this opportunity uh, later on in life to stick it to the crown, she was on the, she was on the side. And I remember, I remember watching her, so she was quite sick at that time. And I remember all her aunties and um, you know, sisters, you know, again, these were all older women, they wouldn't have had a, 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 an idea about what Spectrum was and why they were there, but they were sitting around and they were talking amongst themselves and it was like an, a, re, a really passionate sort of support. Again, not knowing what the, uh, the underlying te uh, technology was, but the rational behind it. She did see that it had an importance for our kids and stuff. So she supported us incredibly. Um, we won, which was a surprise to the Crown. They appealed, we won again. Um, uh, but when you move from a tribunal out into the legal system, then uh, that's the Crown's really strong base. So even though we've pressured them in the courts, we've never got a definitive 
um, come back from the courts to really underpin our stuff. And that's the problem when you talk about principles and the niceties and the things we should be doing right. Um, the moment it goes into a court system, then they sort of take all that away and they start looking at the law as it sits and stuff like that. Um, we, we didn't necessarily lose. We've never taken to the point where we've asked them to rule, but we've always gone to appeal to stop the Crown to do stuff and the courts sort of hesitate. Um, so by the time we got out of that tribunal and we talked about the potential, uh, and now 20 years on from that 2G, the little phones that had no decent screen on them and stuff like that, to a day where it's really a critical part of the way we connect, communicate, and develop. What we talked about then has now basically come to, come to pass. Um, our children, our youth, and our communities are as connected as any youth and is using these, these technologies. Um, and why we were so passionate about it back then, why we wanted to get our leverage, we, we had seen prior to that where the fisheries industry had been the same. Before that, you could be a fisherman, go out and catch fish and sell it. And then the government put in a quota system. Again, they said, oh, well, we've got this quota system. Um, forgot that actually Māori had a pre-existing interest in that, so there was a whole negotiation. And at the end of that, the Crown says, okay, We'll give you 20%. You know, population's 15, but we'll give you 20. So by the end of that, they got 20. Today, Māori own 50% of the quota system. We have a, a, quite a strong fishing industry amongst Māori. So for me, it was the same principle. If we could get this raw resource, the radio spectrum, learn to use it, uh, create the businesses, then it wouldn't necessarily be about getting more of the spectrum, but it would create a purpose for us to be in that industry and grow our capability and look after that resource like we had done with fish. The other interesting fact there is business is business. They don't care who they have to deal with as long as they can you know, get their hands either on the resource or um, do a deal. So as soon as the tribunal ruled, we had telecom, we had Vodafone, everybody was our friend suddenly. And so it was really interesting to get that dialogue. The moment the Crown dropped and said, we're not going to deal with it, well, we didn't have any more friends after that. But, you know, uh, it's, and so I'm going. Um, so eventually the Crown did its deals. It uh, set up an alternative group, not a claimant group, but a Māori group that, want, that was truly committed to the idea of supporting Māori development in IT. Gave them $5 million and says, well, we'll, um, we'll give you the right to purchase Spectrum if you can find a partner to set up a network. And um, so it's sort of like the, the, the gambling, the, the house always wins. So they gave Māori five million and they made us pay 14 million for the spectrum, which they did. And it led to the establishment of the third mobile phone network in New Zealand called Two Degrees. So I think our legacy and what we could do with a very little bit of spectrum, we leveraged it in there. It wasn't the group that the claimants were involved with. It was a separate group. That creates tension. There's a, there's a sort of a, an issue about when the Crown can't get its way directly, it finds other avenues to do that. And they set up alternatives, which ultimately, particularly for Māori, they mean the best, but they're always hobbled by what they can eventually do. But anyway, so um, uh, every generation of mobile technology uh, brings another spectrum auction or another bit of spectrum to be sold to be used like that. So 3G comes along, we are allocated spectrum, we buy spectrum. 4G comes along, the 700 megahertz spectrum about four or five years ago. We come back with the same issue. Crown says, no, we're not going to do it. But what we will do is we'll give you $30 million and then you can go out and develop uh, some um, industry around that. Um, in the meantime, the Crown walks away with $280 million in auction frequencies and we're still, you know, less, less that spectrum. Um, so the next generation of mobile frequencies is now up, it's called 5G, and this is sort of where I've now come back into the picture. Now what I love about 5G and the potential of 5G, um, it, it is, a, it is, so it is, you know, 4G getting your phone, watching your movies and all that type of stuff is, you know, is, is a good experience. We, you know, it's quite capable of a 4G network. The next generation of technology is really designed for taking faster, more faster, larger data pipes, taking them to the edge and allowing you to do things like VR on the move or, 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 or augmented reality on the move, glasses that you just move around with, um, 
autonomous cars. So it's designed for you know, managing autonomous cars. So it's, it's the next generation, and we really sort of set the footprint for the next 20 years. And again, it's it, like, like we were 20 years ago, this point now, 20 years on, this is the chance for us to embed ourselves in this next wave of technology, innovation, and stuff like that. So, I'm, so we're back at the, at the table with the Crown, and we're going through this discussion about allocation of spectrum once again, sort of deja vu. I, I remember when I was talking to the lawyers, um, at the, uh, when I finally found lawyers that were prepared to listen to me and take this, crown, this, this claim forward, there were two... Uh, uh, two lawyers, Maui Solomon, who'd, uh, who had come from the Chatham Islands, he was a Māori Ori, and a Pākehā uh, fellow called Leo Watson. But he'd married a, a Māori woman, so yeah, we stood within the league, and he spoke beautiful te reo, so he was a great, he had, he had Māori language. Um, I remember them sitting there, shaking their heads, and sort of, you know, saying, oh, well, you know, you will take this claim on. I said, oh, that's awesome, that's awesome. And, I, and, and then, you know, as I've taken this journey, I, I sit back and I think, you know, if they had, uh, if you've ever seen Matrix and they have the red pill and the blue pill, I think, why didn't I take that blue pill? Because this is just taking far too long of, and of my life. Um, but I, I'm glad. I'm glad that I've been on this journey. I'm glad to get to where we are now. And I'm glad that, uh, again, um, it's a matter of time, not a matter of if. Um, so this is my meeting house. So just to give a bit of context again of where I come from, this is our meeting house. It's a place... I think in BC they call them longhouses, so it's a communal space where we get to come and we um, hold our tangi, our funerals, or any major um, communal activity is, is held here. Uh, that's the inside of our, our whare. We were holding a uh, pitch competition that day. And um, so inside this house, it's a represent representation of a person, so there's quite a lot of details in here about the rib structure and the knowledge so when you walk into the house you're walking into your ancestors so again there's a lot of you would have sort of heard from professor um whiskey jack today about their um, indigenous perspective well this is how we see our house our place together um, all the photos of all our ancestors are usually around around the space so it's a very important space for us to connect and communicate and to have lots of arguments in there as well by the way uh, this is our river so when I talk about the, I talk about Hukio, but this is another one of our rivers called um, the Rangatike. It's one of the largest braided rivers in New Zealand. It comes from the central North Island main river and comes down there. And this was a main thoroughfare. So when we talked about Edmonton being this cross thoroughfare of, of communities, we had the same. So we had communities coming from the east, the west, south and, and, and north, and this was a resting place for them. So our people would come down the river and they would camp here and they would stay there and they'd go back up and down. So it was a main thoroughfare for us. Um, it also floods quite often, so, you know, around winter time, so it can be a bit of a nightmare. Reminds us that it's in control, not us. And this is the valley that I live in. So after I turned back from Canada, I, I moved into this little house, can't see it real, but in here. It's, a, it's about 80 years old. It's like just... A gorgeous old home, and it belonged to my great 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 grandparents, uh, Hiwawa and Maura. So I've got a photo of the, the, um, the woman in, in my whare. Um, it's, it's just a really basic house, but I really love it because it connects me back to, to the people and their land. Um, we own this valley, it's about uh, 15 kilometres long. Uh, it's sort of encapsulated between the river and some hillside. And there is um, about 60 odd families that live up that, that valley that are related, uh, that were related. And it's about a thousand hectares of Māori owned land. So basically, it's a lot of farming land, cropping land. It's owned communally. So there will be about 1,200 people involved in, the, um, in that land ownership. It brings its complications. Um, and a lot of it's leased out. And so part of this journey I'm taking with the technology I'll talk about is um, I believe we can bring our people home. My goal is to bring 100 families to come back and live in this valley. Um, but only 25% on average jobs will be created on working the land. The rest will have to come from some sort of mechanism, either the food you produce and turn into a high value product, or doing something in maybe the technology space where you can work from home and work globally, as they say. So what has driven me since I've been back there? Um, I've been lucky enough to receive some funding to 
pursue these type of ideas is the idea that when we do bring people home, we don't want to bring them back to ghettos. We want to bring them back to some vibrant living community. I mean, these were vibrant communities. They, our people ran little farms on there. 50 cows would sustain a family. Um, they used to produce milk and send it to the dairy. And then during the 60s, 70s, they migrated away. So a lot of the places, the houses for, for, have fallen over and a lot of the infrastructure is sort of gone. So my goal with the work I've been doing over the last couple of years is how can we entice our, our whanau back, how we can create the community. Um, so my two big agendas is entrepreneurship. So I love the idea of designing and developing entrepreneurship within our community. Um, and the one difference, um, uh, 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 Gordon talked about Powwow Pitch. So Powwow Pitch was an initiative that um, uh, I started out with uh, Sunshine Tonesco. And my partner at the time, would, we'd go to a lot of incubator, she, was a, uh, she did incubators, and we'd go to a lot of incubators, but I would never see First Nations people in, the, in those incubators. So the question was, uh, what's wrong with the incubators or what's wrong with First Nations? My assumption there was something wrong with the incubators. And I felt where it was at was, they weren't comfortable in the space, you know, the suits, the type of atmosphere that was being created, because it was a specific, you know, a specific paradigm that has been used to to get people in that sort of frame of mind. So I thought that if we could challenge the space or change the space and put them into their own comfort space, which in this case was a powwow, then I think we've got a better response. So that first year we ran the powwow pitch, we did it at the summer solstice in Ottawa. Um, 32 people turn up and they had, we had a day with them to you know, pitch these ideas. And they were just, they were awesome ideas. You know, they were quite rooted in the community as they would, but they were awesome ideas. So for me, um, when I got home, um, I wanted to set up a, a similar type of initiative and again focus on the place, the community and trying to build our communities a place as of entrepreneurship. So even though we want to, even though I want to engage with our youth and our people to get into entrepreneurship, the goal was to place it in something like this. And so um, I've often challenged what is the difference between a Māori entrepreneur and a Pākehā entrepreneur. So I was sitting, I was standing just outside of the Adam, Adam Marai looking down, because we look, it's hot on the ground looking down, and I says to a friend that was standing there, we're talking about it, I says, a Pākehā entrepreneur or a Pākehā farmer will stand here, he will look down, and he's measuring how many cows he can put in there. And this is not, this is not, not general, but you put any cows in there, you know, how much money he's going to make for that season, he maybe had three seasons on it. When I stand there as a Māori entrepreneur, I recognise that I have a fuck up a past. So I recognise all the elders and all the people that have come to this point have created this type of thing. I also have a, an obligation to a future for my grandchildren and my great grandchildren and so on and so, so on. And I get this little bit in the middle where I get to make the right decisions to ensure the land, the continuity of the land and that type of stuff. Now, that, again, this is particularly my perspective and our community's perspective. Um, our community has been living here for about 200 years. There's an expectation they'll be here for another 200 years. So I've had this really strong obligation in the middle of it to make sure that we keep this continuity. Sometimes it works, you know. Uh, I go to some of our, uh, our meetings up there and they're always questioning about the marae at our marae meetings. The aunties are always questioning me. They all give me suspicious eyes. They've only just been there for two years. So they're all trying to figure out now what's this dude up to. Um, so the type of programs we've put in there, the entrepreneur program, and my personal favourite, because I'm a bit of a tech geek, is the idea of can we build community networks that are designed with the community in mind and with this new fantastic technology for 5G. Now the good thing about 5G, it's still relatively new, lots of potential, but no one yet owns the space. Um, so some of the things I like about 5G in, in terms of what it potentially, um, potentially, this is my little setup, the things it could potentially do is that because it decentralizes a lot of the functionality. So the idea is it's a, um, what you can do in the cloud now, the idea if you can push those, what they call to the edge. So a lot of the technology is designed to work at the edge. So you don't have to keep pushing a lot of data up to the cloud. And what does that mean? Uh, small servers that you can sit at the edge, they can start processing the information from your valley. So this little setup here, um, where we do off-grid systems, so we design off-grid systems. We have little servers that we put in place in here, and we're working with software developers, pretty open source, to develop these sort of hybrid, local um, uh, cloud-type services at the edge. 
and, and which means less data needs to flow across your network, so it's more efficient and more faster. Um, this little device is one of our early IoT devices, so Internet of Things, our little sensors out in the paddocks. Um, that, if you can see these little snowball things here, nature is amazing. I'd sealed this all up, come back, all these are spider nests. <laughs> so I just like fooled out of this spider nest. I don't know how they got in, but they managed to do it. So um, nature always finds a way in. Um, so what I've been talking to my community about, what I'm passionate about is saying, well, when we start designing these little services at the edge, what does that mean? Well, it means a couple of things. We can protect data in a physical context more locally. So we can create all the sources of data from monitoring our rivers and, and keep that, that local. Um, we can use sophisticated technology. So today we have chips that are designed for neural networks, they're designed for AI, designed for um, uh, machine learning. So all the algorithms that you create in the cloud can be pushed down and do the inference and the decision making can be done at the, uh, at the edge on something as small, in particular visual concepts, as small as a, uh, a meme stick. You know, it's amazing chips that have been designed and how sophisticated and how low power they are. So th you know, that's one of these opportunities as we start to rethink and say, well, not everything has to stay in the cloud. Can we create these small communities of interest around these type of technologies? Um, the other thing 5G does, it provides some other paradigms like um, obviously improved potential for broadband connectivity, but all thing, also things like um, what we've worked on is how do you turn energy from solar off-grid systems and turn that into processing power? And then when you see that, pro if you can increase the amount of processing power you, you, you create, and then you cluster a half a dozen of these little units together, you've suddenly quite a, quite a, got a, a, quite a lot of processing capability available to you. What does that mean? So let's take a drone. A drone flies over, takes lots of pictures, incredible amount of data is collected. In a traditional context, you drop it down, you put it into your computer, and then it spends an hour sort of processing those images. It could be 64 gigs worth of sort of data. I hope there's not too many technical terms here, but a lot of data, you've got to process it, takes an hour. In a clustered system like this, you could potentially design it for the drone to fly over, it downloads it, and it's automatically processed with all that processing power. So it could go from an hour down to a minute. So it's, it's these new opportunities. Again, these are not fixed. These aren't fully developed. The ideas are there. Some countries and companies are doing it. But it's sort of at that time in this change in the internet where, and when particularly the mobile internet, where these are the type of potential. So the other part to this is that Google, Microsoft, AWS won the cloud battle. So all the telcos had all the infrastructure, uh, but they didn't pick up on the idea that actually the cloud would be a, a really important part. So all those big telcos that were the rich and, and really um, had the value proposition, they're now reduced to pipes. So now they're thinking, well, if we're just pipes, we can't make much money. All the value is now in, in the processing type stuff. What 5G does allows them to push more of those services back to the edge and design applications at the edge. Google doesn't own the edge. AWS doesn't own the edge. So they're investing heavily to find applications, designs, and communities that are looking for innovative uh, technologies, applications, privacy-sensitive applications at this edge space. So they want to be partners. They want to find new paradigms to try to take back and find new, econ uh, new revenue streams to take back that back to these type of uh, back to these services that they control, those edge devices. The one good thing about also is like in our case, actually it is, there is some feasibility in communities of interest owning stuff. So the, the systems that we do here are designed for the farming community. We're in an agriculture space, so we're designing a lot of the, these things for farmers, sensing, um, this one's designed, can be utilised for water pumps, solar water pumps and stuff like that. Up to this point, um, a lot of tech people turn up and say, we've got this brilliant idea, we're going to make your farm 10 times more efficient. If you pay us, you know, 100 bucks a month, we'll tell you how much water you're using. And the farmer's sort of sitting there, so that sounds really cool, but, you know, does that lead to the, the bottom line? So by including 
Uh, so this, this particular setup here is designed that the farmer puts in the pole, we can put our gear around it, it's all sort of standardised gear, and we can find a partnership. And there's some studies done that said if a farmer or a community is part of the infrastructure ownership, it can reduce the internet cost by about 70%. So our community of interest is farmers, we get enough of them working together, we can find new paradigms for them to earn some living, you know, sell that bandwidth or do some co-sharing co type of stuff. Um, so my message is, I keep saying go back to it, we're at that space now where if you've got a good idea, if you're looking for, uh, you're looking for um, a generation of technology that's coming through, support for it, then you should be in considering in a community what does these type of systems, systems mean. Um, and as I say, for us, I've got to show what I'm doing this work to prove that if we had access to this type of technology like 5G and Spectrum, then we've got ideas to share. So that's been my sort of, sort of journey about why this has become an important uh, journey for me in this sort of 5G, 5G space. Um, this is one of the sensors I stuck to my wall in my room, humidity and um, temperature sensor. And I found out that my room was cold. <laughs> it was cold, so I did find something out about it. Um, so uh, the other thing is uh, I went around and planted a whole lot of these sensors. These are temperature and humidity sensors. I put them on trees, put them on posts, and put them in, if anybody knows honey hives, this is a, a feeder station during winter time, so it could monitor the temperature in hives. And temperature for hives is quite an important one. So. Uh, this is not a direct 5G technology, but the next generation of 5G, the sensors are, it's, it's pre-designed for small sensors. So thousands and thousands of sensors, this is what it's designed for. Um, so even in terms of sensor environment, for environmental purposes, 5G has a, a real particular um, opportunity. Um, and this is a map of where all our sensors are currently in our community. Um, it's a good map. Uh, the biggest problem at the moment is the batteries keep running out far too fast. <laughs> so I have to go out there every so often for a walk and replace them. Um, but that's, that's sort of the profile. And we've got another space where we put, put these, particular, these particular sensors out. I guess the question is, uh, apart from the fact, I guess one of the things that uh, Māori have been good at, good at, they've stuck to this concept that they're part of a partnership. So these type of initiatives, these type of expectations about these new resources, uh, we're very confident of putting ourselves forward and say, actually, those are our resources and we need to negotiate that. Um, and uh, again, and these are these new modern claims. And, and you know, we don't know what the next one will be. I, I sort of do. So my next one, <laughs> the next one I'm really keen to test with the Crown is space. So the Crown in New Zealand has decided to establish a law in 2017 that said it controlled access to space. And again, it forgot to consult with Māori. Now, why would you think, well, you know, space, what would Māori? Well, Māori and all Indigenous people have some form of relationship. And uh, our stories, our culture, the way we navigate was all part of that type of thing. The Crown has suddenly said, well, it's, got a it's, sort of, and it's gone in the middle of that, comes in the middle of that, and so it says, well, you know, we're, we've got to regulate because we're going to be putting up rockets. And uh, space is going to be really important. And my, my conversation around that is, until you can recognise that, that we have this relation, that might have this relationship with space, you can't regulate it without that sort of consciousness. So, um, again, I'm getting the same steers, not only from the Pākehā people, but from my own. So it's not, it's, not a, it's not a common type of scenario. But I think we need to challenge ourselves. We don't know what the future is. We, don't, we didn't know back in 1999 or 1995 how critical broadband, how critical the internet would become for us, uh, for our nation. But we did know how important it was to, fight, to, to maintain um, our expectation as indigenous people that resources in a general context belong to us and we are prepared to share. But you've got to acknowledge that first. Um, and in the case of space, again, they need to acknowledge that we already had a prior relationship and whatever intervention they choose to put in needs to acknowledge that. And we're not sort of being bloody minded, it's just, you know, as a partnership, the treaty talked about partnership. And that is the key here. You may, you, you will hear a lot, and there are a lot of 
indigenous communities globally that are constantly, you know, uh, under threat or under um, pressure from governments, but they continue, they continue to remind and sustain that it's a relationship. We, we, we are in this together, and Māori are in this together in New Zealand. We, we, we acknowledge that, but we also, the flip side of that is the Crown has also got to continue to acknowledge our rights to access these new resources, our rights to utilise those in partnership with the Crown. So I think that's sort of the, the basis of it all. Um, and then the, the question of why do I continue, as I said, if I'd known 25 years ago that this is going to be a sort of ongoing thing, I wonder whether I would have I continued. I, I think I would have, because I think I'm pretty... Um, I like anything that gives the Crown a bit of a hard time. But um, um, it's this sort of story too. So I, I think uh, we, we have a story about coming, migrating from the Pacific, you know, coming to the Pacific, Hawaii, travelling down on, on our waka and our canoe over sort of a period of time, 800 years ago. And along the way, different people got off, so uh, off the waka, the, you know, one island they'd hop off, and the last island they got off is uh, Cook Islands. And you've beautiful people smiling, laughing all the time, really awesome. Um, and they speak Māori, so they got, they got a, a Māori dialect. And I think what happened is, the ones that were left on the boat got to New Zealand, they were all the ones that were angry. So they were just, you know, anything to have a fight, they're in, right? Anything to sort of have a challenge, they're in. So I think that's sort of stuck in our bones a bit. And for me particularly, it's sort of stuck in my bones. If the Crown sort of says something, I've got to figure out, well, that's not, you know, how do, how do, I, um, how do I get, get at them in terms of arguing something? Um, but there is another reason why I do this. And I've continued to do this. Uh, this is my grandson, who I love dearly, but he's a pain, 14. Uh, and these are my two uh, youngest grandchildren and my daughter. So I keep reminding myself that um, I get a short period in this world, um, but I need to uh, be prepared uh, to challenge and set the groundwork for their future, um, particularly in things like sustainability and being able to use these technologies to uh, improve our environment and create our environment. It, that, that is uh, um, really key to me. I'm going to tell you a little story about this, this little picture here. This was, we do do Halloween, by the way. Well, at least we do. Um, this is in our normal costumes, by the way. Um, and so I took this photo in 2017 when I first got back, and then we took the photo again, uh, but in a, she was in a different uh, costume, like a, um, oh, what is it, Elsa, the, the movie Elsa. So they were dressed up beautifully there, and I took the photo, and I was just going back through, and this photo came up. So I thought, oh, I'll play a trick. So I turned around and says, I don't know what's happened here, but look, this is what it's turned out. And I thought she'd laugh at it. She freaked out. <laughs> she totally freaked out. Because uh, she saw, no, she was winning blue and suddenly this black thing's on. So, you know, that's just the, my little thing. So that's the reason I keep going. Um, I have a general interest, interest in obviously making sure that um, Māori get into these new industries. Some of the key things that happen today to things like data sovereignty. So Māori data sovereignty is starting to rise as an issue. You know, where all this data has been created, is there a relationship? Will there be a treaty claim around this type of stuff? So, um, uh, yeah, I think I can leave it there. <laughs> Sorry for being vast and things. And um, I don't know if you want to do questions, but um, if you have any questions. Yeah, I'm happy to take any questions after that rambling. <laughs> Thank you. So I have the microphone. Do we have any questions? I think, you know, it's a really interesting connection between past present and future, and, and this idea that, um, well, we know the remix manifesto, right? The past <laughs> always tries to control the future, right? And the future is becoming less free, so we have to find ways to control the past. Yep. And so radio spectrum is that silent, invisible resource um, that I think you correctly point out is, is really critical to sovereignty in many respects, in terms of your ability as a community to be, to be reliant, to be resilient, to build an economic future. Um, and some of the applications you talked about, I think, are, as you, are just the tip of the iceberg, right? Yeah. This idea that we will live in these environments where data is ubiquitous and data sovereignty is the key. Who's going to control that data? Because that's future value 
and, uh, and control of that's going to be very important. So let me open it up. And because we're live streaming, I do need to <laughs> would encourage you to ask the question into the mic. Um, so you've talked about one of the opportunities with 5G is this edge space and that it's kind of up for grabs at the moment. Yes. Um, do you see that as a window? Do you think that there's going to be uh, other interests that start to move into that edge space? Or wh what do you see sort of as the future for that for the next five to 10 years? Um, so th there's a couple of, uh, couple of elements to that. So there's a lot of um, software being developed to manage this sort of hybrid cloud network. So things like um, you know, many clouds, uh, there's a lot of open source platforms that are um, moving that way. OpenStack are looking at this hybrid notion. Um, so the software platforms are being developed, but there's still space to develop um, you know, issues like security at the edge. You know, how do you manage? In our case, where we're focused on, for instance, is uh, the power uh, issue. So we want to do a lot more off-grid stuff. We're after density of networks, not one big, like one big tower. We want 10 in our community, 15 kilometers, 10 little base stations. So to manage that, we need to look at ways to manage the energy that's produced because you know if, if it goes dark, you're not producing energy. So we're focused on building algorithms around um, clustered power and then clustered processing. So the more power you can produce, obviously the more processing power you can make available. So those are little niche areas that we're focusing on. We don't know how well that will, will go, but you know, if you're talking, the, the other thing about these networks is they do need to become denser. So if you're in a city, um, you'll start to see things like these really small um, uh, tr uh, base stations start to appear on power poles. And um, there are, so the different frequency bands, so 3.5 travels quite a good distance, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, being able to connect in good dis uh, distance. But these small little ones, they're at 60 gigahertz or 26 gigahertz. Like, this is way up there. I mean, when I was, you know, we were in a, when I started out, it was, you know, 100 uh, megahertz. Now we're talking 60 gigahertz. So just even that 20 years, it's amazing how sophisticated it's gone. Now, the, those little things will only go 100 meters. You know, they, they'll go into your bedroom. Um, the only other problem with that is there are some issues that people are a bit scared about what this is going to mean in terms of health issues. So there is a bit of a backlash on the high frequency type stuff. But what that allows is you put hundreds of these little things up and then you've got, you know, you get these really fast connections, faster than you get in fiber and all that type of scenario. So um, that push in, in, uh, in cities is easy. But when you come out to the rural communities, we're, we're, we're sort of focused on the rural community type stuff. You don't have that sort of same density, so you've got to look at, you know, making density in the in the um, base station. So moving them out like the stuff we're do, we're doing, you know, making more of them, but making them cheaper, and then clustering them into a, into a, uh, into a purpose. So clustered um, processing power. It's not an uncommon thing. You'll see a couple of uh, blockchain initiatives where they will buy your excess um, processing power and they'll sell it in a big sort of a network type of stuff. So that those little applications, I think there's still a lot of room to grab some space in those. And then you can pull it down to some like really small micro type stuff. So, um, you know, collecting the data, managing it, turn it into a platform that people can utilize locally, sharing it. Um, I even seen one website at the moment that's selling, you know, if you've got some data here, it could be just, you know, you collecting some data from around your house. Um, there's, there's a growing market apparently for that type of data. So um, it's a good place to just have ideas, try them out. You know, it's, all the big principles have already been established. So, you know, we know that the cloud works. We know that, um, you know, ML, AIs all come into the table. These are sort of like micro environments now where you can start testing out and creating those type of stuff. One of the applications we're really keen on is visual analytics. So one of the, the downsides of having lots of sensors is you got, um, if you put them in uh, environments, they can, be damaged, if you put them in the water, you know, every three months, they'll get washed away. And if you've got $2,000 worth of uh, sensors in the water and they get washed away, it's, it's a big loss. Visual analytics, which is getting incredibly more sophisticated, is starting to be able to identify traits, uh, in this case, cows. So the way a cow moves, um, if it's standing, it's alive. If it's on the ground for more than 10 hours, you probably think it's dead. So it's starting to it's starting to, uh, starting to get these really sophisticated algorithms that are being developed to, 
to, uh, with a visual analytics component to it. And, you know, we don't know where, that go, where that's going to go. But the type of analytic chips, and I say the USB, USB type size stuff, you know, stick those in a little thing. You'd have, you'd have the capacity that they would have in any major cloud center because it's specifically designed for visual analytics. So the power is incredible, and it's only going to get better. Um, even the AI chips, the machine learning components are all getting smaller and faster. So um, it's, it's sort of that right time to pull back from the, the big central type stuff and start to envision what um, every small town, every small community could build around them in the infrastructure. I think this has really good application to First Nations people. You know, we often get this idea, oh, we'll build these uh, internet connections and that will create this nirvana. Often it doesn't. It creates a lot of confusion, a lot of potential, but people things. But once you start to actually drill down to actual applications that can come out the end of that, you know, privacy will always be important for First Nations people. You can build a physical component to that as well as a software component to that. So I haven't been wondering, but I mean, still plenty of space. If you've got ideas, I would be saying that's a great space to do it. Most of these 5G networks will come on stream by 2020, predominantly within um, cities, and it leaves a lot of scope to think about ideas in the rural, rural area for everybody. Thank you very much. That's a fascinating talk. And, and, uh, and my question kind of has to do with, with how you might uh, assess the impact of this as, as, as uh, 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 an enterprise to, to, to set up something that people may not really know where it's going to go. And, and in our, one of the things that we study in communication in our program is this 16th and 17th century um, developments in places like, primitive places like France. And, um, and, and how they developed road systems, canal systems, rail systems, G gave people the opportunity to travel for miles and who had never. So do you, is there any kind of parallel in what's going on with, with, with these technologies and those other earlier, much earlier technologies that that allowed for the communication of people uh, in and out and had a vast impact or a noticeable impact on the people who lived there and and opened up uh, opened up the uh, their societies and their cultures to other influences and I mean is 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 there a, is there a kind of parallel there that that you might are we looking at something similar to that. Uh, I, I, I think absolutely right. I, I, I think there, there are, like most things, there's good and bad parts of the whole scenario. So exposing uh, a community, uh, particularly our youth, to, uh, you know, to the opportunities also brings a risk that they choose to move on. But yeah, every, com every community risks the loss of youth. I remember a story back in 1918, uh, no, nine, yeah, 1918, uh, uh, they set up a butter factory in one of our communities uh, that I'm related to. It's a, uh, it was set up by a Jesuit priest. And I remember reading why they set up this butter factory. And back then, they were worried about their youth leaving. So it's a perpetual issue for us about youth. But, and exposing them through the internet, as we see, um, opens the doorway for them to move out of the community. But the flip side of that is, you know, the ability to create a job using your creativity or you know, uh, you know, if you're a CGI, you know, doing special effects, and you can call on that spare capacity in your environment to help you do your work or your process work. You know, it's going to create the opportunity for me to come back to my home and still make a decent living. You know, I've been lucky enough to do that. Um, and I see it's, it's it's a it's an it's an interesting one. So we're we're farming, but farming is changing. Just down the road, uh, they've set, set up, put in place uh, one of the first robotic processing units for um, cattle. Um, and all it does is basically split it, cut it, and, and then it goes on to the boning chain. Um, so that just started last year, $10 million. It, you know, 
it goes 24 hours, doesn't complain as long as it gets power. Um, but the boners are now saying, we just can't keep up. This thing is pushing down, and we're trying to, and they're breaking down. So the issue there is eventually that chain will turn into a robotic chain, and those jobs that we used to mop up, a lot of our people aren't going to be there. So when I point to my grandson, hate school, right? He just hates it with a passion. I mean, I fight with him every day to try to get him to school. But you put him on a farm for the day, he will work, uh, you know, tremendously hard, you know, and he comes back and he's satisfied. He actually reminds me, he says, well, I don't know what you do, you're just sitting on your butt, you know, I'm out there working hard. So, I don't keep saying, well, I'm using my head, so I'm using my butt, so. Um, but for him, I realise that he's not, he's not the computer god, he's just not going to be his type of space, so he still needs to be part of that environment. So I've, I've got to figure out for him as a thing, how can I build around him the things that will retain what he wants to be, in that environment and still contribute to and earn a living, um, um, but still allow us to progress technology in our environment. So again, that's my challenge. That's what I enjoy doing. And um, I hopefully I'll find a, a way for him to do what, it, what he wants to do. So it, you know, it's, it's the mind, it's creativity. It's gonna rely on that type of innovation. It's gonna uh, rely on quality, you know, goods that are you know, produce locally, has that artisan sort of focus. That's, I think, the, the, the actual uh, opportunity that will come. You know, coming back to that localization, being able to sell, uh, become a destination, food destination. I mean, all those type of things, these type of technologies will help to underpin. Um, you know, today we, we have a shortage of people who pick apples, you know, so they're really moaning about it. Uh, they just started testing one of the first robotic apple pickers. So again, that's all going to come on to train. And if we want our values looking towards horticulture, no doubt we're going to start integrating technology into that type of stuff. Yeah, thanks, Graham, for that presentation. Really enjoyed it. Um, I had a question just about for people like myself who aren't as uh, aware of the situation in New Zealand, because you're talking about technology that's that's not in place yet, that's coming, and I was just curious about um, so the types of networks and edge applications you're talking about are they replacing things that are already in place, or is this an access issue where there's not really good internet connectivity or or access, and this is kind of the first generation that people will be accessing? Like, what stage are people in, in these rural communities? Um, so, we've got basic internet access, and particularly our community, there's, you know, we get wireless access, 4G access through the local telco, and they have plans based on 4G. Um, 5G won't really come into uh, use by the major telcos until 2020, once the um, spectrum is sold. Hopefully, we'll retain some of those. Um, so these are all just prototype ideas, right? I've, I've been lucky enough, as I say, for, two, for the last 18 months to be able to just go wild. So I've got some funding to, to think about these type of things. But I'm starting to coalesce down to an opportunity. Um, uh, telecom of Spark is our big telco. They've got a lab, so you can go into their lab and you can test some of your ideas with them. And they're looking for companies and they're looking for ideas. So again, it, there's a lot of stimulation sort of starting to happen um, and uh, particularly in the, like the rural areas like there's you know if, if the cities are going to be quite well t looked after particularly in terms of the infrastructure but I still think there's scope within those cities to find niche applications um, the, the, the main thing is that, that it's sort of this uh, an ability to become really aware so you know autonomous cars the, the ability to use v visual analytics or um, uh, augmented reality, so wear your glasses and you can walk around and contextualise stuff. All those things are, you know, five years sort of a journey, uh, but a lot of the early type stuff. So, for instance, you see the HoloLens, HoloLens 2, uh, um, that's uh, Microsoft's sort of version, uh, big bulky type stuff. They've got a little computer basically in there and that's why they're so bulky. Uh, in a 5G context, all that processing power is on the edge. So you would have a more leaner glass experience and be able to do that. Now that's still, again, it's talked about, it's under evolution. Um, it's that, those are the type of things you've got to be thinking about. So, you know, even, even visually analyzing data on the move, you know, how will that play out? 
Um, in our case, we have farmers that drive around a farm. If they find a hazard, now they have to write it down. In the future, with a, an augmented reality component, they could potentially just marker it and it gets automatically acted. So, I mean, we think of them as the, you know, sci-fi type stuff, but think about it. In that 20-year journey that we've gone from when I took the spectrum to where we are now, it's, it's amazing. So, you know, five, ten years, it's just accelerating. In terms of that, what's happened is all these all the cloud-based stuff we do today, all the stores, the analytics and stuff like that, that sort of, all that, all that, all parts of that can now be pushed down and get better, better applied at the edge. So what you can do in this big space potentially pushes it down, but it also creates that paradigm where potentially you can start protecting data and more, uh, and having data permission as the process, not data capture through these, these organisations. So it's interesting. I, I have no particular insight of where it's going but I do think that if you have an idea and thinking I would be I would be going and working around your idea around what it would look like in that sort of environment there's no loss in thinking about it because you can still apply it in the big space but there's some real things to be gained by thinking how you could interact and, and build your applications or your, your businesses around that type of part Thanks, Graham. Fascinating. Um, <clears throat> I guess the question, and you, you partly addressed it from worries a hundred years ago about losing youth from the community. Um, really good connectivity is always a two-edged sword. Uh, it lets people um, blend into the larger community. It dilutes the uniqueness of any culture. Um, but by the same token, it can be used to preserve language and help groups to form and, and so on. What do you see as the balance just now and later um, between cultural uh, enhancement for the Maori people um, versus that sort of uh, dissipative effect? And, and is this a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, you know, does it need to be controlled by uh, each individual group? Um, so you're talking to a guy that lost his phone seven days ago, and actually it's been quite great because I've, you know, I've had to sort of live without it, and um, I've actually started to notice people again. But I am noticing everybody else is on their phone. Um, uh, my grandson uh, didn't take too much notice of, of Facebook and all that type of stuff until about six months, no, yeah, probably four or five months ago, he got a girlfriend. So suddenly he's, uh, he's on this messaging type stuff like that. Um, again, I, I struggle. Uh, I struggle with the fact that we often talk about the great things that come along with creating connectivity and we put it in these communities. Um, uh, and then we expose our kids, particularly our kids, and we get bullying and we get all this type of, you know, the, the, the downside to some of this, this connectivity. And then as we as a community who are, who are really struggling to figure out how we're surviving and how we live day to day, um, are then now being asked to sort of figure out how do we address this, this ogre at the door, this potential at the door, because uh, we, we, again, we, here's, it's going to create amazing things. You know, the government today will provide free connectivity to our marae for five years. You know, you, they'll put it in, they'll pay for it. And you know that's going to be great. And I have people at the Marae saying, "Well, what are we going to do with it? You know, we'll just get the internet faster. Is it going to really create value for our community?" So those are the type of questions they're asking. I think part of it is, you know, it's not just good enough to connect, but it is incredibly important to either build an application around it, an opportunity around it, build an awareness and in, integrate it into the day-to-day -day function of your community and make sure that there's some relevance to it, uh, to yourself, the community, and pot potentially your youth, and expose them that, that type of scenario. Um, art is always a good one, you know, that sort of interaction between media and, and things, our people are drawn to that, that type of stuff. So I see value in creating small um, media components around that. We're in the process of discussing that now. Um, uh, yeah, so there are elements I think can keep people focused locally. 
I think we do have to, like anything else, it's an evolution. People move away, people come back. So, you know, there's no solidness around it. I do worry more so about how that affects kids personally. So um, they seem to survive and they seem to flourish, but you know, we haven't got it right um, at all. Thank you, Graham, for just introducing us in the context of, uh, uh, of where you're coming from. Um, so my question has a little bit of bias, uh, and so um, my nation is currently negotiating a land claim, and every once in a while in conversations uh, with my professors or colleagues, uh, there's something that I realize that is missing from our land claim. So I speak to the legal and technical committee, and so you bring up an interesting notion uh, about sovereignty over space. And so um, my, my people where I'm from is from where a giant fell from space and landed when he was hunting. And so we're very much from space. We're descendant of that too. So um, in terms of us negotiating our process and, and you uh, helping in the negotiation of that, I'm wondering what is involved in uh, the, the treaty uh, over sovereignty of space and, and whether that includes uh, uh, satellites, transportation, and even diminishing effects of, of pollution or, or what other factors are included in, uh, in that treaty? Um, so, so, it's, so it's early days and it's a rough and ready sort of concept. I, th I think for us, it's, it's the first stage of that is to get the Crown to recognise that it, its regulation, it's, you know, we'll, we'll just cause neutral isn't actually neutral. It does have an effect. And I'll give you an instance. The government to date has probably invested around $60 million in the industry and space in New Zealand. There's probably massively more here. None of that has gone into supporting a development of the indigenous communities. And that's not of right. It's just, um, you know, it's the best dress first forward. But as an industry, so 2030, they talk about the industry being a $4 trillion industry globally. So it's a big industry to, to get into. It also talks about, um, you know, in New Zealand we have a company called uh, Rocket Labs and they launch satellites. Um, only just started launching last year. So we're starting to evolve different, uh, you know, different opportunities. Um, there's this really cool series called Mars, it's a History Channel one, and it talks about, you know, looks at now and looks in 30, 2033 when we eventually get to Mars. And I remember, down, I remember seeing this poster from NASA about recruiting for Mars. So it was a sort of a mock-up uh, for Mars. And it has this uh, guy in a space suit. Oh, sorry. I'm not sure if it was a guy or a woman. But it had somebody in a space suit. And he's, he's hoeing away. And it's got a message, Mars needs farmers. And I thought to myself, well, our people are already, you know, they, they see themselves as farmers and stuff like that. Should we, be, should we be exposing our kids to the idea that they could be the farmers of Mars? So it's these sort of extensions of the potential Establishing with the Crown that actually there is, you know, there is a corresponding expectation that if you're going to support development of the space industry, there is some recognition that Māori have that relationship and you need to help us foster and build that and continue to build that relationship. Um, it exposes us also to issues about the global expectations about ownership of space. So a lot of the treaties that were signed were signed without Indigenous input or knowledge. And they tend to talk very technically about, you know, in terms of the access and all the things about, um, uh, you know, what it means to go into space from a Russian American sort of perspective, you know, because they dominate the space race. So even those sort of concepts about, you know, our rights to space, but also we're a colonised people, so we understand the devastation that colonisation can can take. So is there an opportunity for us when we start to go out into space to take a view of the of space in a different way? I don't know. I'm hoping that our people start to think about these things, realise that our relationship with space is more than just what our stories are, but is a potential launching pad for the future and have these type of conversations. Now, I don't know where they'll go, but I do think that we potentially could go into space, um, not be a coloniser, but be a, 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 you know, take some of our values to make sure that that part of our, our, our universe uh, doesn't suffer the type of things. I mean, it's you know, it's an idea, and I hopefully that we will, but we won't be able to do it unless we're participating. So in that, in that context, um, I, I don't encourage. Uh, you know, I can't encourage. But you know, I always uh, like in our case, uh, we just assume we don't we don't wait for the crown to acknowledge us. We often just go ahead 
and just are not, we, we just already assume that we are, so you know, there's no issue about us using spectrum and stuff like that. You have to be a bit more negotiable now, but I guess in those early days, always go ahead with the already the assumption that that's uh, something that you control and you're inviting the crown into those conversations, not the other way around. Hope that's not too radical, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, and once again, thank you very much, Graham. Uh, wonderful talk. Lots to think about. Um, and as again, past, present, and future. And thinking about what these decisions today will mean for the future. Um, and on that note, I would like to thank you again for coming to Edmonton. A small gift on behalf of the MACT program. Thank you. Is, is, it a, is, it a, is it a quart of good Alberta oil sands? You can arrange that. Okay. Um, so thank you all. Um, and once again, I was pleased. To, wonderful to have you here at our 2019 uh, Spring Institute Research Symposium. That concludes our presentation for this afternoon. I look forward to seeing many or most of you at the dinner following at Chantel Local. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.